Hello everyone, I'm Tamika Weatherspoon, one-on-one -on -one with the very talented, tree-loving nonprofit Clarinets for Conservation. Joining us in our studio, we've got founder and executive director Michelle Van Haug, also group members Mark Fujina, Ian Tyson, and Debbie Larson. Everyone, welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank Thanks for having us. Now we can guess by the name Clarinets for Conservation that you all play the clarinet, right? We do. We do. What do clarinets have to do with conservation? The clarinet is born of this tree right here, the African blackwood, uh, known as Delbergia melanoxylin. Commonly, uh, people uh, have known it as grenadilla or ebony, sometimes zebra wood. Uh, this is the most valuable hardwood in the world. Um, what is not typically known about this is that this is the wood, the heartwood of this tree is used to produce a majority of the orchestral instruments from the bodies of clarinets and piccolos and oboes to black piano keys and fingerboards of cellos and violins. This has been used uh, so much in the musical instrument trade that it's often referred to as the tree of music. So uh, what we are doing is we're taking the product, the clarinet, back to the product source and we're using it as a way to teach about future sustainability of this tree as well as many other trees. How many trees have been put in the ground by this organization? Oh gosh, if I'd have to guess, it's 2010, I know we planted 100 trees. Uh, and then 2012 we planted 500, and 2013 we planted 647. Where are you teaching specifically about this tree? Well, we are teaching both in the United States and Tanzania. In the United States we do predominantly educational outreach. Uh, we also tour and perform as a quartet and sometimes as a duo or a trio. And then in Tanzania we have a secondary school where our music program is based. It's Korangoni Secondary School based at the foothills of Kilimanjaro in the town of Moshi. Uh, that is where we do the music program, but also we do quite a bit of educational outreach in the Moshi area. Well, Mark, you also teach at the school. What age group is that? We have secondary students, so I w it's about 16 to 19 year old. But you're also a teacher in Phoenix. How does that compare teaching students in Phoenix to students in East Africa? It's a great question. Bef well, I started teaching in Phoenix after going to Tanzania. Before going, I had taught in smaller capacities, so I was really expecting a lot of differences and kind of preparing myself for that, but I was really struck by how similar the kids were. They're just, they're just your average student. They really want to learn. They're really eager. They're very respectful uh, and very bright. The only real difference is cultural. They have less opportunities than we have over here. I'm not sure who's the camera person, but you've been filming a little bit of your experience. Have you gone back and rewatched and just seen how much progress you guys have made? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and we're what's really been astounding for us is starting to hear of the way that these students are doing on their national exams. Uh, the students that have been in the music program are scoring above and beyond any of their peers. So we, of course, knowing having read so much cognitive research about the benefits of music education and how it carries through into the other subjects, we knew that was going to happen, but now we get to watch it happen. And what that has done is made the staff at the school have a great deal of respect uh, for us as teachers, and um, and it's made it, the music program is becoming almost a part of the core curriculum at the school now. You both taught in Tanzania. You two are relatively new to the program. What are your expectations going into teaching in East Africa this summer? I'm very excited for the summer. Um, I teach uh, at El Sistema program in Philadelphia, which um, it's similar to the Tanzania program this summer. Um, we bring free instruments to our kids. We um, pull them off uh, basically very poor areas of the city and give them something to work for and give them something to, to strive for and have goals to, to reach. And so I'm excited to see the two differences between our culture and their culture. So it's an advocacy group that you came from mm -hmm. and you're coming from an Air Force background, is that right? Yes, I was in the Air Force band for seven years and that's actually how I met Michelle. Um, we were in the same band. We would do out educational outreaches through the Air Force too. Um, I was stationed in Germany so I've had some international experience as well. 
Great, so you guys are bringing something new to the mix this year. Um, I want to talk a little bit more with you, Rochelle. Can you talk about how this project all came about? It was your idea originally, right? Yes. After a uh, professional career in the Air Force Band, um, I happened to see the documentary film Impingo, The Tree That Makes Music. And so after watching that film, I saw that direct connection between myself as a performer having something that I could do in a place um, in the world that I was very passionate about that has a great need uh, for people to teach about conservation mm -hmm. and sustainability. When you first got to Tanzania and you started playing the clarinet, a lot of them had never heard it before. So what was that like trying to convince schools to let you teach this instrument to children? You know, it is, it, it's a place with little to no opportunity you know, right down to if kids want to do something after school, like play soccer, they go to trash piles and collect rubber bands until they have enough rubber bands to make a soccer ball. So in that kind of uh, poverty, um, there's a, a, a desperation for something, uh, something extracurricular, mm -hmm. um, something yeah. curricular uh, that is engaging and um, uplifting. So. The first time the clarinets were brought into the community, um, it was just, it was met with um, somewhat of disbelief. Uh, community members didn't believe that the African blackwood, that this tree could, was actually capable of being cut down in such a way that the clarinet is, with those intricate tone holes and silver keys in place. Sure. Um, Tanzanians, or East Africans, use the tree um, to carve um, uh, to depict spirits and maybe carve animals, um, elephants and, and giraffe. So uh, it was met with a little bit of disbelief and that, that uh, disbelief has turned into absolute welcome and, um, and a, there's been almost a, 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 a sense of, a deep sense of pride and honor in Tanzania uh, that people have said, this is Tanzania after they hear the clarinet played now, which is interesting because it is virtually unknown in that part of the world. Now, not so unknown, thanks to Now, you. it's becoming very known, yes. All right, well, thank you for coming to our studio. Thank you for having thank us. You. And now we're going to hear some beautiful clarinets playing right here in our studio.